Hello. Uh, somebody asked me how to let go of fear. And, gosh, there's such a long answer to that. So I decided I would give the long answer. Um, and I call it living the catastrophe. Or you could say expecting the apocalypse. Um, that's where we all are, folks. We're living the catastrophe, expecting the apocalypse. Now remember, apocalypse, apocalypse, the word actually means revealing. So things are coming to the surface. And um, remember, we're in the 2020 clear vision is hopefully what will come about as a result of the huge purgation of gunk, the swamp, you might say, that lies at the bottom of the collective unconscious and lies at the bottom of everybody's individual unconscious. Everybody's individual unconscious is connected to the collective unconscious. In fact, you might say they're one ocean. That ocean is swirling with currents, currents which have been engineered to feel like fear. Okay, so the fear is everywhere. It's all pervasive, the atmosphere. And to think that it's not there, or to think that you're immune from it, uh, you're kidding yourself. So what I do is I'm constantly aware of the currents and I'm constantly shedding them or like transforming them into love. Because remember, there's only really two emotions, only two real emotions. One is fear and one is love. Fear contracts, constricts, love expands, fills, fuels, Fear is, uh, believes in scarcity, um, lack, uh, love, feels the abundance, feels continuous abundance pouring through the universe over and over in all ways. So that's kind of the short answer. But let's go back. And what do we mean by living the catastrophe? It feels like we're living something that is going to have this horrific end moment, this terrible uh, you know, blow up of the bomb or blow up of the civilization or some kind of blow up, just like we have been taught to think that the universe began with a blow up, the Big Bang, so it'll go out with another Big Bang. And um, each of us also on an individual level, we're seeing that our death as that kind of thing too, or oh my God, I'm going to die. And I, I'm terrified of dying and I'm a terrified of my own body because my own body might betray me and give me this horrible disease that is infecting the entire populace. I mean, this is where we're at, you know. There's huge amounts of fear. Huge amounts of fear for each one of our own bodies because we don't trust them, because we don't realize that they are brilliant. They have an immune system that knows exactly what it's doing if we connect to it and if we keep on supplying it with what it needs, which is letting go of stress, it's always gonna be there, just keep letting it go, keep transforming it, which is eating foods that are good for us, which is getting plenty of exercise and plenty of sleep. Those are the four, the four things we need to do. It's not hard, but people are so busy and so rushed, even now during the COVID time, so busy and so rushed, Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, always looking towards some end point. If I just get to blah, blah, I'll be okay. If I just don't have to do blah, blah again, I'll be okay. What happened to the present moment? We're either in the future or the past. We're constantly living into the imagined um, catastrophe or the regret, um, the, uh, the nostalgia and regret or nostalgia for the past. And so the point is, where's the present moment in our way of doing time, of living in time, we see time in a linear fashion, point by point by point by point by point. And the present is simply a point then on this line, so it's linear, this line, which is constantly disappearing yeah so the present moment really doesn't exist because it's always if you once you become aware of it it's already passed so the point is i can remember the hippies used to say to me and i'm i'm a hippie too but they'd say to me hey be here now be here now and i'd say 
Yeah, but the now can be large or small. So the point is we need to evolve to the point where we experience the present moment as a presence that is continuously enlarging and deepening with ourselves at the center. Each of us is the center of an expanding, infinitely spacious universe. And once we start experiencing time as cycles, the cycles, you know, we can look at them as the planets moving around the center of the earth, moving around the earth, and they're all, each one has a cycle, and the meaning of each planet is its cycle. And so we're embedded in these various cycles that are interpenetrating and moving out from this center that each of us is. When we have that worldview, and it's not just a worldview, it's actually a world experience. When we experience the world that way, we don't live in the catastrophe anymore in the same manner because we're not always expecting doom. Okay, so let's go back now and look at me in my life because I know what I'm talking about, given the fact that by the time I was two and a half, I experienced, and I think I've talked about this before, experienced the, um, the Hiroshima, uh, horror, the horror of a Hiroshima was on the radio and I was with my mom and, and her mom and her sisters listening to this and it was August 8th, uh, 1945 and um, the adults um, cheered. They cheered over this catastrophe. Why? Because my dad would come home that night. He was in the Philippines and so it meant that the war ended, ended earlier than they expected and he could come home. And so that's, that was their perspective on it. For me, it was this sudden recognition that the world was going to end in my lifetime unless I prevented it. Okay, so there's the magical thinking of the child, thinking she can prevent it. She can prevent the bomb from blowing. She can prevent the catastrophe which threatens every single second from happening. And guess what? That catastrophe, 75 years later, is still there, but now much, much larger. There are so many nuclear bombs in so many countries, and we live with it. We're living inside that, that expected catastrophe, but somehow, miraculously, it hasn't happened. Why hasn't it happened? That's a really good question, because certainly from the point of view of human nature and the accidents we create, it should have happened but it didn't, not yet. Maybe it never will. Maybe we'll wake up in time to our own destructiveness with our technology, possibly. Let's hope so. Okay, so the bomb, the bomb, the bomb. I was afraid of the bomb from the time I was two and a half years old and that colored my childhood. So I, a catastrophe was every second. I had to stay awake. I didn't want to go to sleep. You know, it was like sleep is, oh my God, I might die in the middle of the night. So the fear of death, the fear of death. And so I was constantly wanting to look at dead bodies because I was fascinated by this morbidity. I was fascinated with what had already ended and lost its life. You know, I look back on that and I think that was pretty strange, but it's who I was then. And there's a lot more I could say, but the point is the fear of the bomb, which for me was absolutely acute and constant and meant that I was always pretending to be a child. So anybody that has this sense of catastrophe and is, you know, aware of it, um, feels like they're pretending when they just act normally. <laughs> because, wait a minute, look what's, look what's out there, look what's, look what's going on. So it kind of leads to a bifurcation of the self, you know, the, the pretending, the masks that we wear. You might say that what's going on now is an outpicturing of the masks of our daily lives, the roles that we play, the pretenses we go through to be more than another person or more than we were before, or you know, any, any kind of just constantly striving for some kind of goal that isn't catastrophic, instead of being here, right here, right now, feeling the present moment extend through space and time forever. Okay, by 1960, we're not earlier than that, there was this thing called the Fatima Predictions. I can't remember when it was, but it was in the 40s somewhere. 
where the uh, Our Lady of Fatima had appeared to three little girls on a Portuguese hillside, as I recall. And there were all these predictions that they said the final prediction would be given to the Pope and opened on in 1960. So I figured, well, 1960 is the end of the world then. That will be the prediction. The Fatima prediction will have to do with, 19, with, the, with the end of the world. And so this happened to be the year I graduated from high school. So, I mean, why apply to college? I mean, you know, what's the point? I mean, I figured it was over. My parents convinced me to apply, and it's like they, I just did it for them. You know, I didn't, you know, I figured it would be done. Then, November 1960, John F. Kennedy gets into the presidency, and somehow everything changed. There was not just hope, there was real life. Somehow, life had re entered the cosmos, had re entered the universe, and that swelling feel, feeling of, of aliveness was in me now, something I'd really never felt. And I was just so thrilled and stunned and astonished that I could actually go on. The, the apocryphy, the apostrophe, or the way the apocalypse had been perhaps, you know, sidelined. We aren't gonna, we aren't gonna die right now. We aren't gonna do that. And then of course, the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, where there we were again, on the brink. It looked like we were on the brink. And then somehow we got out of that. And then came 1963 and the assassination. And I am among those who experienced that, who can say where they were at that moment when they found out. And um, from then on, uh, it was obvious that you could not trust the government, that something had gone on that day that was not what we are being told. And ever since then, I've had that tinfoil hat on my head, you might say, or that paranoid consciousness. Paranoid because I see things as screens for other things. It's never what it seems to be. It's always more, and there's usually some kind of nefarious purpose behind it. Okay. So, then. Then we get to Y2K. That's, I mean, I'm looking, so I'm looking at the, the predictions of doom and, and you know, my, my own experience of the predictions of doom. Y2K, uh, which was when the millennium changed over, for people that don't know this, um, there was some kind of, um, there was some kind of rumor that all the computers would crash because they hadn't prepared for this in their algorithms somehow. They hadn't prepared for the 2000. They could just go up to 1999 and then that was it. So that the New Year's Eve, we would, experience a complete worldwide system crash of all the computers which would just completely take out everything that we'd built in civilization. And so my husband and I at the time, Jeff, who is a computer guy, in fact he was doing mainframe frame computers way back when, he said, yeah, that, that might happen. I don't know. He didn't know whether it was going to be real or not. So just to be safe, we decided we, we lived in a yurt at the time in the mountains of Wyoming. And we just got all sorts of, you know, got four years worth of firewood and, and we got, you know, all sorts of canned stuff. And we, we prepared, and I even prepared the, the whole village of Kelly, where we lived. You know, I got a meeting together where we all talked about it. Um, I don't think the village of Kelly had ever gotten together before, but we did. We actually got down and talked about what if that happens? How can we help each other during that, that time? And then waking up the morning of the year 2000, wow, the lights work, the cell phone works, the computer works, wow. And then watching the people on television, the people around the world as the sun came up, all these cultures celebrating on the beach, in cities, in the countryside, celebrations all around the world. This is moment of complete possibility, which we still have, it's still in there. We still have that collectively, that, that complete possibility of total celebration involving all of us. Okay, then 2012, the next moment of possible apocalypse or ascension now we called it. Okay, now that started, that, that end date, 
started back in 1987 when our, our Jose Agueles wrote a book about the Mayan calendar and its end point supposedly in, on December 21st, 2012. And then there was a, a bit of a um, quarrel about was it really then or was it in November of 2011, but the science, not the science, the myth was settled eventually at December 21st, 2012. But the point is back in 1987, he got everybody going, everybody that had any kind of what I'd call nuage credentials, who saw things in more spiritual terms, but not the usual religious terms, um, believed that it's a really good idea for everybody to get together and meditate. So this really was the, the August, I think it was the 17th and 18th of 1987, the very first universal meditation, okay, all for a common cause. And it was done in all sorts of places, usually sacred places. People would go to sacred places around the earth. In my case, it was a giant yurt that had been established um, for other purposes, but I was there with a bunch of, of nuage people from California, and I was the astrologer, and, you know, it was an astonishing, it was an astonishing time of meditation and um, understanding the astrology of the events and so forth. And it's all it was all leading up to then that end date of 2012, well, where if we raised our consciousness enough and if we stayed, stayed there, raising it up, then we can shift to a timeline or be, make sure we are on a timeline where the whole world will not just survive, but thrive. And there are some people that still say, yes, we have reached that timeline. It came in during that time of 2012 and that we won't be able to go off it, which is good because it is the timeline of thriving rather than um, dying, uh, the civilization dying that is. And I tend, to, I tend to go along with that, actually. Okay, now, this year, 2020, and remember, we have Pluto in Capricorn, getting to the place now where it is conjuncting, it is beginning to conjunct the position that it occupied, went back, in other words, it's the first Pluto return in the United States chart. So this is a significant time period because of that. Anyway, it's like a five year period. It'll be over and there'll be a, uh, this place won't be recognizable by that time. Who knows what it's gonna involve? We have no idea, but it's happening. You can feel these incredible undercurrents where all the old is dying. The old has to die for the resurgence for regenerative energy to take hold. Meanwhile, this year, starting in January, Saturn, the planet of karma, it's a 30-year cycle, conjuncted where Pluto is now at about 23, 24 degrees of, uh, of Capricorn. And then, not very much longer, Jupiter came in and also conjuncted those two. So we have this major conjunction of three planets, which is rare anyway, and it's lasting, basically, they're going back and forth, each one of them, all year long until December. And I will speak of that at the end because that's the, you might say that's the apocalypse we're expecting now. Uh, this whole year, everybody knows that this whole year is somehow enormous, it's somehow huge and it's somehow horrible, and yet somehow we have to get through it or not, right? Because what did they introduce at the end of February, beginning of March? The quote, pandemic, this virus which is going to take hold and create, you know, total economic breakdown, total uh, emotional breakdown, total collective unconscious breakdown, the whole thing. Everybody knows by this time, what has it been? March, April, May, and June. Five months, everybody knows that anything's possible, anything, at any moment, because all the structures are up for grabs. Most of them are, are creaking, they're not working anymore. Schooling, I mean, education in general, medicine. I mean, my God, we're learning how not to give our authority away to another person, hopefully. To recognize the immune system is the most important thing that we have, our own bodies. Our own bodies are so 
valuable and they are brilliant. They know exactly what they're doing if we give them the help. And then, of course, the you know recognizing that the media is um, only going, it, it's an agenda, agenda-driven um, mouthpiece and it is um, a propaganda arm of the the deep state or the what do you what do you whatever you want to call it the cabal or you know now it's been identified with the Democratic Party but it's like the Democratic Party gone crazy and uh, it's like that's so that the the media the politics you know the cultural transformation it's all happening at once and we're all involved with it we all know we're completely there with it and it's like oh my god how are we going to handle it well, if you have this uh, linear view of time, then yeah, you see the election of this year as the apocalypse, right? It's like, oh my God. And meaning the great revealing, it's like, okay, as, as uh, the Q people say, is this virus about a virus or about the election? Because it's, everything is geared towards trying to get make sure that Donald Trump doesn't get reelected. That seems to be the, the overall theme. And that if he does get elected, um, all hell's gonna be, get to be paid by all sorts of people. If he doesn't get elected, all hell's gonna be paid by everybody. That's my, my point of view. It's like, it's uh, lesser of two evils. You know, uh, two evils meaning um, unknown consequences of this election that we're going through. However, I tend to feel that there is going to be a resurgence, that we're not just dealing with Pluto's death, but we're dealing with the rebirth possibilities of Pluto also. And in order to get to, into that understanding of things, we have to look at time not as a line, not as just a linear thing going from one place to another, you know, a line from birth to death, but instead as, as, as cyclic. Time is always a cycle. Time, time, there are many times they're always in, 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 involved with each other. They're always interpenetrating each other. And if each of us stands in the center of our own world with all these cycles that we're involved in, constantly interpenetrating each other, we don't have that apocalyptic attitude anymore because we're involved in a regenerative process. Every single one of the cycles that we experience has a first half and a second half. I think I did a podcast on the second half of any cycle. And all we tend to do in our culture is go for the first half, growth, infinite growth. When you turn around and start going the other way, we don't like that. That, that feels like defeat. So, you know, infinite growth for an individual life. Oh my God, you know, into your prime. You're total, your body is beautiful. You're attractive to other people. You're reaching your prime in terms of achievement and so forth. And then, oh my God, look at what's happening. Oh no, I've got to, I got to prevent it. I got to stay young forever and so forth. And, you know, concomitant fear of being old, of <clears throat> fear of old people. Um, notice what's happening to old people now in um, institutions they're put in, where COVID is deliberately introduced to them into these institutions. Um, I don't want to go into that kind of stuff, but it's fascinating how we denigrate the old because it's, it shows us what we're going to be someday. Like I'm old, I'm almost 78 years old now. And I'll tell you, it is the richest period of my life because all of the cycles that I have experienced all this time. I've consciously experienced them. I'm aware of how meaning is created through experiencing cycles of many kinds. And so this life for me, this is an absolutely, the fullness is now here. The richness is now here. It's like this is harvest time, you might say, just like in our garden here at Green Acres, um, village our gardens are just like bursting with life it's like how can we harvest how can we deal with it all because it's just so full now of the life that we planted back in the spring and so this year we it's almost like this is a composting year we're we, the 2020 is a composting year the old structures the old everything old is being 
um, just put into mush. And then beginning at solstice, oddly enough, just like in 2012, beginning at solstice, the two planets, Saturn and Jupiter, which are moving back and forth through late Capricorn and, and Saturn actually went into uh, Aquarius for a sh very short while, but it's going back now towards Capricorn. It is in Capricorn again. Um, they will be conjunct together at zero degrees of Aquarius on December 21st. I mean, it's like, is that divine timing or what? And that, my friends, is, I feel, when the, the seed will be dropped into a regenerative culture that we will create by recognizing that all cycles have both beginnings, middles, and ends. The cycle of human life, the cycle of civilization, the cycle of what our country was and now is going to become something else because the way we use power, which is Pluto, was in a very adolescent fashion for what is it, 248 years? We were at war 93% of the time, at war. And no matter what you say about Trump, he's pulling troops back. He doesn't want war. He hasn't started a war. He's the only president in 30 years that hasn't started a war. What? I thought we counted on war, and we did. And so all the institutions, even that, even that of making sure we have another war to get more weapon systems going, to get more money in the banks and so forth, and more you know, people that create all the other stuff that go along with having war. We have to shift what we're doing. We have to shift what we're doing. But that moment when Jupiter and Saturn conjunct at zero degrees of Aquarius is the brand new beginning, I feel, the brand new beginning of a regenerative culture which we are going to move into. And yes, it'll be difficult. Yes, there'll be lots of stops and starts. Remember, this is Aquarius they're moving into, which has to do with experimentation, exploration, co individuals fully expressing themselves but cooperating with each other in common ventures. On all levels, that is what the promise is. And that is what lies at the end of this unbelievable, ongoing catastrophe that we are experiencing now as the old culture, the old culture within ourselves, individually, the old, all the gunk that's in my unconscious has to come to the surface. All the shadow stuff has to come to the surface to be cleansed so that we can begin again.